allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Schaefer, will you please take attendance? President Alessandro? Here. Secretary Stepick? Vice President Brasington? Here. Treasurer Guthrie? Trustee Donnelly? Tom is on his way. Trustee Bailey? Here. Trustee Schaefer? Here. Thank you. Lakeville and Clear Lake are having theirs on the 16th and 17th. 
I put on there the dates of the visits, the dates and times of the interviews that would involve um, board members and administrators, and then I also put my info, email information and Stephanie Mimi's email information, so if you could please RSVP, let us know if you can make it, that would be great. Um, we hope to see you there. So that being said, as I said, this part of the, the self-study is a great reflection process, and we, um, it gives us time to sort of think about what are we doing that we could be doing better and then what are we also doing that we take for granted every day, like Paul mentioned, that really makes us shine? So what I'd like to share with you tonight is a sort of digital portfolio of where we're at in our progress at Leonard Elementary and spotlight an aspect of Leonard Elementary that makes Leonard extremely unique. Students 
watching a video where they were asked, what does it mean to be peaceful in your community? And some students often suggested it. We may be helpful, safe, we can help clean the earth. Leonard Learners reflect. Why is it important to show effect? So we can um, like just remember what we've learned and not just like the next day we're like, what did you learn this yesterday? So it, it's like a reminder that we like have learned this and talked about this. And finally, Leonard Learners expressed his Leonard, I 
would not deny that, but I don't think it's necessarily different from any other elementary school in that aspect. I think that at any school that you go to, you're gonna find a ton of talented kids with unlimited amount of potential. But I don't think that you will find um, a school that draws out and discovers that talent, encourages and nurtures that talent, and provides as many ways for kids to share that talent with others quite like what it does. Um, we, uh, we were able to succeed because the students at Leonard have been given this, this tools to do just that. Um, their egos are eager to learn, because they've been shown that learning can be fun. Um, their school allowed them to have a theater club where they had a blast all year long. Um, they're problem solvers. They've been taught how to communicate effectively with one another because that's how problems get solved. And I, I witness that every day in theater club. Uh, we had different kids with different learning styles, different capabilities, different backgrounds, different personalities, different ages. Um, but they've been taught patience and compassion, so they really have the ability to work through those conflicts in a constructive and respectful way. Um, the kids didn't have to solely rely on my and my co-director's encouragement um, because the kids at Leonard really take it upon themselves to support and motivate each other. Um, the students have been taught leadership skills, but more importantly, I found that they've been taught to lead with kindness and with an open mind. Um, as the kids advance in grade levels here, they of course advance in maturity, but it was surprising to me how they kind of take on this leadership role with the younger kids and take responsibility for them. They look out for them, but they never look down upon them. Um, they, uh, we, we had a great time at Theater Club. I'm so fortunate to have been able to do this at the school. Um, it was one of the most rewarding experiences in my life, and I'm so thankful to the staff at Leonard for their dedication to teaching our students not only to be great students, but to be great people. Um, this year, we have 44 kids appearing on stage, and about a half a dozen or so more that are behind the scenes helping us. So we're confident it's going to be another amazing year. Um, we're performing The Wizard of Oz on February 10th at Oxford High School. And we have ticket vouchers for all of you. Um, we'd love to have you come out. And you can see firsthand how you really can get a better representative of the Oxford School District and Leonard Elementary. Before we move on, I just want to make a quick comment. I appreciate the information because I you know typically we get going and you guys typically always leave. So I wanted to just say this before you before you leave. We've been down the IV path for quite a number of years now and, and look forward to the uh, recertification out here. So anything that we can do, we'll, we'll kind of talk amongst ourselves, see if, how we can support, making sure, because it is really important for the IB group to see board members at these. So I want everybody to uh, make sure that you give me your schedules and we can coordinate so that everybody's here on this. Um, so we can coordinate uh, at least one or two board members on each one of these. But in addition, I also wanted to say uh, thank you for the uh, theater club that you put together. I mean, we, it's very unique in our district that we have parents uh, really jump in and, and understand that we're preparing students in all aspects, not just academics, but the arts and athletics. And sometimes, or a lot of times, we find that that's what really dials the student in to wanting to be at school as an extracurricular activity. So thank you for your time that you put in and, and all the rest. So I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, um, moving on. Board of Education Matters. Oh, we have, I'm sorry. Okay, we have two motions. Okay, 
I grabbed the wrong. I printed off this one before. So we have two motions on here, and it's uh, regarding the dates of our upcoming meetings. We have a couple of scheduling issues uh, that came up, and we're going to have uh, Trustee Schaefer make a couple motions. There's an opportunity to discuss it as well. So. Yeah, the board can do this a couple of different ways. The first one is that um, we, we need to reschedule the November 7th meeting based upon your discussion at our last meeting. And so before we make a motion, um, I guess we can do it two ways. Either one, we can discuss what kind of date that you want to move that to, or we can put a date in the motion, and then you can discuss it as a part of that motion. Uh, Probably I would recommend that we uh, we move the meeting from Tuesday, November 7th to Wednesday, November 8th. That way it will be after the election and um, the, the board may have more to discuss or we'll know where we stand based upon those election results. But, but again, that's... Let's go ahead and read the motion with the 8th in there. And then we'll vote on it and we'll go from there. Move to reschedule the November 7th, 2017 Board of Education meeting to Wednesday, November 8th, 2017, 6.30. Support. 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 Mr. Bailey? Yes. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, we have another one. Cancel the March 27, 2018 and June 19, 2018 Board of Education meetings. Support. Support Dr. Brazington. Discussion. I will bring up, uh, for those of you that are questioning why we're moving those, those are uh, a third meeting in that month, in those months, and they reflect superintendent evaluation, quarterly quarterly evaluations. Uh, I talked with Superintendent Throne and he and I best uh, came up with the idea of tacking that on to one of our already scheduled meetings in the in the favor of saving time and money uh, for having everybody here an extra day. So can you repeat those dates again, March 28th? March 20th March 27th, June 19th. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, curriculum and instruction. Uh, Mr. Weaver. Oh, sorry. I'm just wondering if you want to take a look. For some reason, I thought it was March 20th, Tim. Because March 27th, we're at Daniel Extra that day. So I believe we wanted to cancel the March 20th, which is our extra board meeting that month. The March 20th is scheduled to be at the board office. Yeah. 20th is the yeah. workshop extra meeting. That, that is correct, but um, we, we had the 27th because of some other activities that week. So we were just going to have our two meetings, the 13th and the 20th, not the 27th. So there's a conflict of other activities on the 20th as well. Yes. Yeah. That's. <laughs> right. No, the 20th. Would remain. So the 13th and 20th would remain. The 27th is the one that we're canceling. Is, is the one that we were canceling. That is the week for spring break and we had some other activities. Okay. And so. Um, so we are going to keep the 20th and can't we cancel the 27th? Correct. But again, I mean, that's. Yeah, 
you what George is saying is not a 24-7 original. Correct. The superintendent is supposed to be reported. Absolutely correct. Um, maybe I'll say it this way. Just that month, because of that, uh, that scheduling, it was better to keep the two days of the 13th and 20th versus the 13th and 27th. Okay. So again, it's, it's the board's meeting. So, um, Would it be okay if we met at DA on the 20th? Is that going to cancel out on there because it's on the 27th? Yes, yes, that's exactly what we do. So we could do that? I just want to skip out on yep. so, yes. so we need to update the calendar uh, to reflect instead of being at the Board of Education office on the 20th, it will be at DA on, right. on the 20th. Yes. Okay, and then, we need, yep. and then we need to make sure that DA is aware of that change as well. Yep. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for the confusion, folks. So the quarterly, yes. the quarterly review that will be on the 20th. Correct. 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 Tech down at the end of the 20th meeting. Yep. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. Um, item six, curriculum and instruction. Mr. Weaver. All right. Uh, we're gonna. I'm gonna present on student growth. Some of the changes that we made this year. Um, also, some of the changes we made to teacher evaluation this year, um, just to kind of keep you updated on what we're doing and trying to improve and trying to move student achievement along. We're really happy with this year's process. Um, and so we're gonna go ahead up here as a quote. Really don't know who, uh, is that J.C. Penny, the, the, the person that uh, started the stores, and this is not a little bit from what the administrators have put together as far as their presentation. And I think this quote, I liked it. I was going to go find a different one, but then I liked it, and I just thought it did kind of sum it all up. Growth is never by mere change, and it's the result of forces working together. And I really think this quote, uh, whoever found it, uh, needs to be uh, complimented because I think it really sums up our student growth process this year. Um, I will apologize. I had a couple of handouts in the back of my office. I had forgotten them earlier. I thought I'd be able to stop back by, but I was over three hours coming back to Van Arbor today. So I apologize. I feel like I'm kind of yelling at you, but uh, we're going to have to live with it. Um, evaluation for teachers is 75% uh, is their classroom observation from the principals. Um, and 25% is their deliver a growth plan with their SLOs. Um, and it will be the average of SLO 1 and SLO 2. We'll go a little bit into that in just a minute. In a year from now, it's going to go to 60% for the classroom evaluation part. That's where the principal, once again, comes in, evaluates, sees them. Um, you know, we have uh, pretty uh, stringent guidelines as to how many times everybody gets a formal. Uh, new tenure teachers or non-tenure teachers get uh, a couple of formals, and then everybody gets uh, at least one uh, informal or two walk informals, and then non-tenure get quite a few informals as well, too. Um, so it's quite an evaluation process, quite a growth process. So what is a slow? A slow is a student learning objective. It is a detailed, measurable goal developed by educators in collaboration with their evaluators. That's basically it. It's a pre and post test is what we look at. Um, the teacher sets up targets, tries to, gives the pre, teaches the kids, does a, the uh, uh, teaching and learning cycle, formative assessment, um, uses different strategies, teaching techniques, sees where the kids are, keeps moving them along, gets to the end of teaching the content, or the, the, the content, and then reassesses at that point, and then compares the difference to see the growth. And therefore, you can then see the impact of instruction at that point and what happened with the child. That's kind of the basic overview of the SLO. So in reflecting on what went well last year, um, it really was about the process last year. We didn't focus on data because we didn't want the teachers worried about it. Also, we weren't sure exactly how all this would come together. So in order to make sure of how things work and not to punish the teacher for our learning process, we went through, took the data piece out of it, still did all of that piece, 
but didn't count in the evaluation and it was more about participating and learning the process. A lot of the buildings found it better to do it as a group as they went through so that everybody built that common understanding and they basically did it around reading, elementary did it around math, and they worked all together on it and they basically shared strategies and that's the main thing that this is all about as we go forward. What else worked well was we worked on it all year and went slow and steady. The, uh, like we said, the process was collaborative. Um, all teachers and administrators participated last year. Uh, the growth scores were determined by the participation. And then basically what else went well with them was it really helped to get that basic foundation of what an SLO was. It helped us understand what changes we need to make as we move forward. So, what we look at changing is, these are just general areas, and I guess you can read them, I'm not going to read them to you, and I gave you a handout in your board packet as well too, that's one of the handouts that I forgot, um, I can show it to you in just a second. Here is the, the handout. We can see that. Um, we changed the focus, the actual evaluation process with them. Um, what tool we use, we still use Marzano, but we actually changed the form. It's a lot more succinct, a lot better. We also changed um, the pre and post assessment formula. We had a, uh, a formula that we used that we thought was a little too stringent and didn't encourage teachers to try different practices. So we changed that formula so that it was less um, punishing if your slow didn't work because this is really about collaboration and trying different instructional techniques. And as we all know, when we try something for the first time, it doesn't always work. So we wanted it to be about teacher growth, and that's the main thing. Even though it is student growth, what you need to know about the SLO, it is about professional practice growth. Plain and simple. It really, when you boil down to it, it is not about the student growth that occurs. It is about the teachers changing their practices and then taking those practice changes, those changes in practice, and applying them in all of their classes, in other ways in their content. It is not about necessarily the student improving specifically on that. That is kind of a side benefit that occurs as you go through the student learning objective. The main thing, though, is that those teachers are reflecting on their practice, discussing, reading articles, reading professional literature, attending work uh, conferences and so forth, talking to their fellow teacher, and trying to change their practices. Um, we also exempted the ancillary staff from the actual SLO process, and we came up with a second um, process, which you'll get a little overview of that tonight as well, too. Um, Teachers are now doing two SLOs. Those SLOs vary in length depending on what level they're at for the most part. High school, because their kids change halfway through the year, their SLOs are semesters. Um, they don't have the same kids second semester, so it's, it's, you cannot do them in that situation. Elementary, middle school, are some of them are doing semester or unit length slows, and some of them are doing year-long slows, SLOs. But they are doing two of them this year. And that each one is tied to a different element or instructional practice in Mars Islands. Focus evaluation. Um, let's see what else. Change the rubric. That's one thing I should talk about. Last year, our, our basic rubric focused a lot on exactly how much percentage growth could be, could be shown. And we realized very quickly that is hard to really scientifically and fairly measure for the teachers. And, what I, and also when we sat down and we included a couple of teachers in, which state law requires, into this process as we discussed it, we really wanted it to be a focus primarily on We want this about teacher collaboration, teacher growth. How are they talking? How are we going to help them do these conversations? And how are we going to get them using more data in their practice? So we changed the rubric, and the biggest change that we did was instead of having, based on the percentages of what they actually showed in growth, we had a basic cutoff of 70%. If 70% of your kids made the target, you started on the rubric at a 2. If you were under 70%, you started off the rubric at a 1. 
and then you went up through the rule break based on what you have tried to do and accomplish in your professional effort towards the SLO. Because once again, I'm going back to it's the, the student growth that, is, that occurs is a side benefit. What this is really about is teachers growing their practice and really using that database decision-making instructional practice in their classrooms. That is the part that we want to see grown and really trying to change that practice at Oxford. Are there any questions at this point? Are there any, Dr. Are there any discussions about having student teachers who are highly effective and not have a slow or skipped evaluation year? Or we have not at this point. Um, we are so new in the process that I don't think we're ready for that. Um, we may in the future do that. The only thing is, is that quite honestly, this data driven process, they should be doing on their own. They should be actually doing it more. So I don't know that letting I don't want to say letting them out, but removing that is really what we want to do, is we want to encourage this practice. Because all it really is, is assessing the kids, formative instruction, making sure you're doing that formative assessment, you're, you're monitoring where you're at, and then assessing it to kids. If you really do that teaching and learning cycle, you're going to show growth. And really, we just want to keep, we want to encourage that. So I don't know. It's really, the hard part is not so much letting, um, on this all is really not on the teachers so, so much. Teachers. It's on the, you know, Paul and, and Daisha and Janet sitting here. That's really the ones who would probably like to see that because they have a lot of steps in this process of checking things off and so forth. So I don't know, down the road we may figure out a, 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 a way to compromise and do that low because the states also require that we evaluate every teacher every year. And I know school districts are trying to figure out some ways to get around that now and, and doing that. And I, and I agree, you need to let, lighten the load on the administrators on that end because you really can't go in and effectively work with, you know, at the, at the high school, the teacher got, I think in the end, about 30 teachers. That's a lot of professionals to try to juggle and try to help grow and coach. And coaching is not an easy task, uh, especially when you're dealing with a professional. Um, it's not like you just go up to a professional and say, hey, I need you to see, I need to see this, I need to do that, boom, there you go. I mean, you really got to have that dialogue and that, that, that process, and then go back into that classroom and talk with the teacher again and work through the issues and the problems because they've been doing it, teaching as long or in some cases more long, uh, longer than our administrators have been administrating. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's quite a process to get teachers to consider and change practices. And while we, we like to always quote best practice, um, there's a lot of best practice instruction strategies. So there's a lot of things that work. So you get into those philosophical decisions, but we're at that down the road as we, as we develop. This. I would love to investigate something that would just have teachers who are highly effective have just the student growth goal, and then not necessarily involved in the formal observation or informal observations. That would just, you know, it would reward teachers for being highly effective overall, and it would give the administrators more of a chance, I think, to work with those teachers. Yeah, and that's a great idea. Just something to consider, maybe. Yeah, yeah, because that's part of the process. If we let them out of the student, uh, if we have teachers not do the student growth, then if I teach biology with you, who am I working with yeah, at that yeah, point? So that's a great idea, maybe, is to then at that point, if down the road, we can look at the observation piece. I don't know what the state law on that. That's Mrs. Lukowski. Yeah, have yeah, to, the growth goal, for sure. But Something yeah. else to consider maybe as we look at a given team in our agreement with the OBA. Yeah, so that's something we could look at as we go down and lighten the load on the administrators. He's never said that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I had no mercy. He's never said that. <laughs> so is there any questions? Because I'm going to move on from the student growth part of the, the evaluation. Going to the actual focus teacher evaluation. Now, this is the evaluation model. This is our old um, evaluation form that we use, basically. There was 41, and Joyce, I think we were still using it when you were with us. Um, there was 41 elements, and it was very cumbersome to use. There was too many elements, and when you started marking everything, it really watered down scores. It was hard to really manage. And so this year, they, or a year ago, they started rolling out a new uh, Marzano teacher evaluation form called the Focus Evaluation Form. And it takes these 41 elements and condenses it down. Um, and now, this form really doesn't necessarily show that in a good, good way, 
but it really does. There's only 23 elements on this, and underneath of each, there's much better information and guidance on what to look for, which I'll show you that in just a second. Um, and it really helps to teach the, the administrator who's evaluating, plus the teacher, A, know what is, it helps the teacher know what is important, what the, the evaluator is looking for, but it also gives the administrator um, help in the, if somebody's struggling with an area, you can now you just go look into the uh, form and you can work with them on, hey, this strategy really works here, let's work and you can go do some further research with that teacher and help develop that strategy. So this is, I'm really excited about this part. Uh, matter of fact, excited enough that I was like, man, I wish I could really be back in the principal role. That hits me every once in a while when the state keeps changing things too as well. So, um, over here on this side, and I don't know how well you can see this, is an example of an element, and I apologize again for leaving those forms, and like, uh, I think last time you guys all had basically laptops, so I thought you'd be accessing them, so of course, we don't have electronics, yes, yeah, and we have one have form one that you can share. We have one copy. <laughs> and you have one form that you can share, so you can look at. But under those elements, there are specific things that you can look for for the teachers to be doing and the students to be doing. And it really gives you specifics. If you remember back to the old form, Dr. Drake did, there really wasn't. There was general statements there. Um, teachers, it should look like this kind of thing. Here is specifics that you can see and that you should be seeing in the classroom. And also as a teacher, you now know what exactly that element is and what that element consists of. So it is a level playing field and it is a great tool to have those discussions back and forth with the teacher and you're able to go through and give them guidance and they're also they're able to see for themselves what guidance and where they need to go and direct their own professional practice, which is really what you want. Teachers improve, teachers improve when they reflect and work on things. They don't improve necessarily because Ken Weaver walks into their classroom one day and says, you need to improve. They need to see it themselves and most teachers are very much professionals and they want to do the best job they can. I've not met any teacher yet that has not have had that focus. But when you do something one way and you think it works, you sometimes don't see the forest through the trees necessarily, or through the students in this case, and all the day-to-day -day stuff that you have, and so it helps to have that teacher reflect on their own practice, and they start realizing, hey, maybe there is a different way, and I can do this, and it may work better, and also, they're able to talk to their fellow peer, and they're able to have those conversations, because their peer might say, hey, this is working for me, I'm finding great success, look at this data, boom, there you go, now they've got their confirming answer, and then they go from there, okay? So some of this, you really don't need to know too as much. This was more for the teachers and that. So they did have two deliberate growth goals that they would be choosing. Those will be tied to their SLOs so that their SLOs or their student growth is directly tied to their um, professional practice. Last year, there was many people who were kind of scratching their head. How does this all work together? How does this work? This year, because they're doing, and I forgot to mention this earlier, I'm surprised the principals didn't remind me, is that they're doing content SLOs. So now, if they are a math teacher, they're doing math. If they are a science teacher, they are doing science, and so forth. And so now, now they pick the area, they pick their, their area that they see, they go look at their data, they pick the area that they didn't do as well in that they would like, and we're slowly changing that process to be away from the state data and really going towards our own local data because the state data is of such poor quality that it really can't be used for item analysis and so forth. And so you really need an item analysis to be able to do this process. So if we're really working hard, the elementary is a little bit further ahead of the secondary because it's just the nature of the elementary and the way they collect data and so forth. But we're really working on it. So you look at your data, you pick your SLO, then you pick your element in the, the focus teacher evaluation, you line them all up, and away you go. And you do that twice. Um, throughout the year. So it's really, I think for a lot of people, has really come together. And quite honestly, for all the changes that we made, I asked Mr. Gibbons today, has he heard anything uh, from OEA members? And he said, I have not heard a peep. So if he hasn't heard a peep by now, that means things are going pretty well. And that's kudos also to the principals 
who have to roll this out. I get the easy job. I have to tell them. They have to take it to their teachers. Um, ancillary staff, we changed how they do. We gave them more options. We realized after last year that ancillary staff, because of the unique nature of their roles, they needed to have more options. Ancillary staff are counselors, speech and language, uh, uh, social workers, uh, school psychologists, uh, special ed that don't have directly kids in front of them, um, ID coordinators, uh, stuff like that. So we put them all under this area so that they would have a couple of different pathways in which to move and show their student growth. I think they're a lot happier because they're freed up from the, con the constraints of the SLO. And so I think they, they find that they have things that they can do because I think that's the biggest thing is teachers wanted to do things that they thought would impact student achievement. And that was very awesome to see. And we took that constructive feedback and we worked with it and figured out we had a, a separate side group that worked on this and like to thank them. They did a great job. We got a few tweaks to do, but for the most part, I think we're up and going. And we changed a little bit of principal evaluation. So we did 55% is on their leadership practice, which that is kind of the same thing as what a teacher gets. Um, I'm usually the one that does that part of it. Visiting the buildings, working with them, that type of deal. You know, there's several elements underneath there that they get marked on and observed, and they add evidence or artifacts into a collection. And based on that, then they get marked. They also have a student growth score. Now, they don't have direct control over the student growth score, quite like a teacher, because that's one of the reasons why we set it up the way we did it, to really give teachers that control over the student growth and feel like they can make a difference. The principles and my uh, student growth and STEM and so forth are all based off of what everybody else does. So the score that the, the building as a whole gets, that's the score for the principal. So that's 25% of their evaluation. 20% is their professional growth score, which they choose three goals and they work on all year. Two of them are professional. One of them is more like a little bit, can be a little bit more personal as far as, hey, I want to prove my professional practice in this way. It still has to relate to school. It can't be like I probably put a hand still be dropped by that 40 pounds that we're talking about for the last year. So, well, I actually talked to But, but I have to see here or there. All right. So that's the evaluation. Any questions? I would like to um, point out, as, as a slide, I know we had a slide up there that showed 41 elements going down to 23. It's actually much more significant than that. That's, that's 41 out of elements in one, one domain out of four domains. So the new one is 23, it's got all four domains combined. So it's much more significant focus on, instead of like 60 some elements. Yeah, it's actually, yeah, you're right, Paul, thanks. Yeah, it's actually 60 some elements on the one. So it really does a nice job of honing in on that craft. And practice and it really gives principals, I think more than anything else, a real good chance to really get in there and work with the teachers who are more so versus, I mean, you were so worried about going in. When I was doing the evaluations, I was going in with my laptop, my iPad, and trying to type and trying to mark things and everything else. This really helps solidify things and make it a lot more, as it says, focused. And really, I think it will help them to do an even better job. No questions? Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, it was towards the end where you talked about principal evaluations. When you were going through the um, student and teachers, one of the one of the things that's really significant to me was the introspective way in which you're trying to improve yourself, right? And looking at information, looking at what you're seeing, what you're doing, and, and uh, almost being your own self-assessment and creating slow. Where is that in the principal world? Where is the principal self-evaluating? And and, 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 and and I didn't see it in those three categories that they're put under the same type of philosophical change that maybe the teachers have. Okay, they, theirs is mostly in their professional growth goals. When they work on those goals, those are areas in which they identify, self-identify from their own practice as areas that they would like to work on. So they do that assessment, basically. We don't require the, the actual self-assessment that's in Marzano. It becomes a bit, um, uh, 
what's the word I'm trying to search for. But they just do it functionally. They, they, because it's not a, I mean, they are extremely busy and so forth. It tends not to be as, as in depth because it's an electronic form. So they, what we do though is they set up their own goals and then they, they have to get those approved by me. So then I also look back at what observations I've done and they have those scores as well too. And they can look for areas in which they want to improve that score and they identify them and then they run it by me. I then approve the, the growth goal or not approve it or say tweak it this way or do this. So that's how that works for them. Okay. Is, is there anything like a peer evaluation? I mean, do, do a teachers looking at, it, at, at, at their students and they're saying to themselves, how am I doing? Do the, do the faculty participate at all in the evaluation of a principal? You see what I'm saying? I mean, you, you, you've, you've done a great job embedding into the culture of the teachers that they are looking at themselves, looking at their class, looking at the, the mechanism, and operationally making changes. But I guess the question is, I, I think that would be really challenging, but how would you do that as a principal? How would you do that same type of thing when they've got 30-some staff people that they got to look at the ways that they communicate, the way that they interact, the way that they deal with teachers. The way, you know, there's a whole bunch. Just the teacher has to worry about how they communicate with kids. Right. So the way they, there's just a couple of questions that sounds like in there. Um, <laughs> right now, the teachers do not participate in the evaluation of the principal directly. Indirectly, they do in the fact that I attend many of their PDs, I show up at the school, I'm involved in the PD uh, sessions, and I have opportunities to talk to teachers and so forth. So indirectly, they do participate in that way. Um, the hard part is, is that in trying to get that, I've seen um, those, are, those types of setups before, um, and you get a mixed bag. You get some people that give you honest feedback, and you get some people that, because you're the evaluator, it's not quite kosher what they get what they get back. So you got to be careful how you set that up. And currently, right now, we have not included that aspect in the principal's evaluation. We do encourage the self-reflection. I mean, that's what elementary principals and secondary principals meetings are about. Um, they meet with me at the midterm as well too. They met, I've already met with them this year and discussed their evaluations from last year and then also set up the process for this year. And so they have that part of a reflection and area. Like I said, they also go through setting up their goals as well too. That's an area for re reflection as well. And then also at the end of the year, I meet with them and go over everything and, and have that time to work with them. The, the role of the principal is very complex. You are expected to know everything and basically we joke about it sometimes but in the end you're responsible for everything and that goes from heating and cooling to actual instructional practices in the building they are responsible for every thing under the sun in their building and in the end so it's a lot to reflect on and that's why we try to narrow that focus with the Marzano instrument and maybe what we need to do is show you that piece for them you might be able to see that because it really does ask them and it does the same thing that the teacher thing does. It gives them look for us. It gives them ideas of artifacts that they would be collecting. And that's what I expect from them is that when they sit down, and also I forgot, they have a reflection log in the, um, as part of the, their professional growth practice, there is a reflection log in there in which they answer seven or eight questions. They answer three questions or four questions on their student growth and how that worked in their building and how that process went. So they're reflecting in that aspect and ask what, what did they learn, what data did they show, what areas would they like to grow in. And then there's like six or seven or eight questions that are not yes or no answers. They're all going to take a paragraph or so of reflection that they need to do over their own practice and what did they learn throughout the year and what areas they would like to improve. So we have that built in and that process they go through with me and I'm their think partner in that regard, and then they also are encouraged to work with their fellow principals. And part of their reflection, too, are those surveys. They do you know, <laughs> sometimes survey their staff, or we do a district. Yeah, I did forget. I do include that. 
Uh, the principles that is part of the artifacts that they collect, they, the, um, the, the survey results, we send those out for the, the community, the staff, and the students in that, depending on the age level of the kids. That as well as information for them. And also, I look at that as I'm evaluating and I include some areas and look for that they might want to offer those surveys and so forth. So that also gives feedback that it's not directly, but indirectly gives the evaluation process as well. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Elson, um, from a principal's perspective on this, uh, the way the slow is structured is I have to have my teacher be successful in their slowness because it feeds my slow. And Ken has to have us principal be successful in our slow because we feed his, his evaluation also. So it's, it's almost like we're all on the same team working to try to have help students you know, show growth and achieve. And what that does for, as a principal, like you said, there's so many hats that you wear that sometimes you get caught up in, in management and running a building and running a school. Um, this really forces you as a principal to really look at um, supporting your teacher as the instructional leader of the building because you have to find ways to work with that teacher to help them be successful in getting their students to the level that they can be at. Because you know that that's going to be part of the group or story. And I can't send it up to the teachers and say, well, you know, I hope you do it, but if you don't, that's on you. Because now that's not on just them, but that's on me too. So it really does help you reflect on what things you can do as an instructional leader in your school to help the best teachers and maybe the struggling teachers or whatever in between to help um, all of them be successful again. It reflects on the school. And so Ken would support us as principals in giving us the, the tools and the training and the support that we need. Um, I don't want to sound like a selfish thing, but you got to do it so he's, you know, he has to do it. So we all are on the same page, all the way down from the top, all the way down to the students. Thank you. In addition, um, here, the principals have cohorts that we built within ourselves. Um, so we have a K-12 sub-teams that we are doing um, evaluations within each of the buildings just to practice the tool and to get better at the tool and to kind of create um, a more cohesive evaluation system amongst us. So we're all in little sub-teams and subgroups, and we bring that information back and, you know, Thank you. Yeah, I, I would just um, say it this way and that uh, indirectly, sort of like how Paul stated it, not this year, but next year, you know, 40% of even my evaluation is going to be, at the end of the day, directly related to how well are those principals helping our classroom teachers inform that instruction and grow student achievement. That's really what it boils down to. And I think for me, uh, I've come full circle in that precisely this is probably one reason why I don't like the discussion about teachers getting bonuses with just their classroom results. At the end of the day, a lot of times, while I have my students maybe for one hour a day, the success of my students, when I have them in my class, may be dependent upon other teachers being successful in their classroom. And I think when you artificially introduce this competitiveness to where only limited amount of teachers can get um, a, a bonus or a reward, like what you would find in the private sector. I think you're going to find when the teachers start to clam up, not share, and now all of a sudden, instead of us all working on the same team and trying to build our students up and all uh, having the results of that collective effort, you would find people who, okay, I'm only worried about my kids in my classroom and forget about helping my, my fellow teacher next door. And so uh, I just, I, I think this is a good point to just uh, 
I don't know, maybe just share my my opinion on that because I think in the next year or two that's going to become more and more uh, political and more and more uh, hot topic at the state level. I, I think that there's going to be pressure to have school districts sort of um, artificially introduced as competitiveness. And, and that's a concern. Just want to Any other questions? Thank All you, right. Mr. Weaver. Okay, I got item B when you're ready. Item B, hold on. All right, uh, we have a couple of curriculums that need to come through. These are these did come through. They weren't quite ready with the other I think, 40 or so or 38 that were uh, we approved. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it was. Um, these weren't quite ready. These are classes we've been running for a long time, and they actually I bet you if you were to go back and be able to find the record, probably have been on it one time or discussed, but because of uh, the latest people at county rules, we want to make sure that they have officially gotten your stamp of approval as the Board of Ed approves all the curriculum. So hopefully you've had a chance to go over that. Um, the ones that Agri-Fire did this class, um, not that it's uh, a class that are, there are partnerships and it has a last component, um, and then it's, it's an outside class that's to get involved. Um, and then also we have the Past class, which is the, um, the it's a, an academic skills class for online learners. It's kind of an introductory to online learning that helps them uh, develop those skills to be successful, um, which are very important in the online um, environments. Okay, we had two motions. Uh, Dr. Grayson. Move to approve the Extra-Virtual Academy Partnership elective courses, Agri Projects K-12 and PASS K-12. Personalized academic success strategies as presented. Support. Support, Ms. Schaefer. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Now, quickly before you do the second one, just so you understand the background, I don't know what was actually in your packets. This is the, the curriculum that was already approved, but due to the unique nature and just making sure with the people accounting rules. Because some of these classes, we proved them 612, but we do, we have extended some of them to K-5. Now, the curriculum is adop adapted and age appropriate. We don't use the same exact, not all the courses do that, but to make sure that we're able to, we wanted to make sure that they were uh, approved both elementary and secondary. And a lot of times, some of these curriculums, especially at the fifth grade level, we may use a class that could be 612, but it's only used like at the fifth grade level. But since it's K-5, at 612, so we're coming back just to ensure that to make sure it's all learning process this year. We've had many changes in our school. Just want to make sure you have contact with us. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Your motion, please. Mr. Schaefer. Move to approve the Oxford Virtual Academy Partnership General Elective Courses for Elementary and Secondary as contained in the document K through 12 OVA 2017-2018. Partnership courses. Support. Support Dr. Brazington. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Item 7, Finance and Operation, Mr. Barnum. Good evening. No items uh, for me tonight. Thank you. Item 8, Human Resources, Ms. Lukowski. Well, um, I do not have a recommendation this evening. However, I will next meeting. Um, we did add a fourth grade classroom at Lake Dahl due to high class sizes, or class sizes in that grade and, and high need. So um, we've done some shifting around and had a special education opening and I hired that person today. So I will have it on the next agenda. So are those additions, uh, Mr. McDivitt, due to? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Is that just due to people moving in or yeah. people choosing? Particularly um, between um, like late August and Labor Day. So we had a big push there when school choices closed down. 
this is not a this is not a product of school of choice. This is students in our that just enrolled late in the, in the district. And some of them really thought that school started at the late because it's consistent across the state. It's just a Thank you. All right, yeah, thank you, Nancy. Item nine, student services. Still enrolling students, as Christy said. <laughs> so we may have another additional I think, I think we're okay. slowing down. Okay. I'm sure you guys work together. I'm quite confident of that. Thank you. Item 10, board policy. We have a motion. Uh, read second reading. Policy. Schaefer. Move to approve a second reading of policy number 5200, attendance as presented. Support. Support. Mr. Bailey. Yep. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carries. Thank you. Unscheduled audience participation. All right. Unscheduled audience participation. Clarification, Mr. Prone. None? None? Okay. Scheduled activities. Uh, do we have all these posted on the web? site. Um, looks like there's quite a few. Board of Education meetings, parent-teacher conferences, all choir event, parent-teacher conference, board meeting. So as long as we have them all posted, we're good. All right, thank you. Final board comments. Mr. Donnelly. Ken Weaver, thank you. Um, just thrilled to see an evaluation process that can be very cumbersome at times. Um, done for the right reason and done the right way. Uh, so great job. Great job. Raising the um, Just enjoyed the presentation from our um, Christian events. Um, just a great job with the IP program here at Thank you again, Paul, for hosting. I echo what um, Mr. Donnelly said. Um, just excellent work. And I know I closely work with Nancy. Yeah, it's just a phenomenal. I, just the presenter. This was a team effort. <laughs> there were a lot of people, um, and Nancy, <coughs> administrators, um, a lot of people were involved. So thanks well, for well, your efforts out. just truly make an impact on classroom instruction. And I uh, just want to say thanks for doing what you do. Right. Mr. Bailey. I uh, just want to echo the, uh, the great presentation. Um, I do quite a bit of this in my professional life, and I know how important that is to the team to get that feedback and know you care when you get that feedback. So, I'd like to see the, the personal touch with you. Ms. Schaefer. Um, I'm going to echo Good job, Ken. Also, Sam, I've been hearing a lot of good things about the meetings that are happening on Wednesday night, so I just wanted to remind everybody, 6.30, um, you know, I've been steering people. That way, a lot of people have a lot of questions. I think it's really great that you're taking the time to do that. So I, I just want to say thanks for doing that and everybody else who attends those. Um, and great job on the ID. I love Leonard. My daughter is um, a special ed kid, and so she started off here in the ECSC program. So I, it's such a great school. It was, I thought, great that mom was really heartful. And I think she kind of tied Leonard up right in a pretty little box. She explained it in a great way. Um, great feeling out here. So. I'll see what I can do to come out here. I'm already going to Clear Lake for one of these, but I'll try and see if I can help you guys out. Very good. Uh, yes, Ken. I, I think you look great. You know, you look great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're good. You're good. You too. Thank you. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that uh, you know we have a lot of things coming up. Um, that are super, super important to our district. And when you really, Ken, when you make the presentation, you really see the effort. And it's, this has been going on, and, and I think in the past year or so, we've really focused our, our attention.
attention um, towards student achievement. And it's, it's a focus of Tim's on his review, and it, it's all the way down. And, it, and I believe that when you look at that, and everybody's goal is student achievement. So from the top all the way down, everybody's tied together, just as Paul said. His success is measured, and your success is measured in Tim's success, and is ultimately measured in the teacher's success, where it's most important and where it's addressing the needs of our students. We've got a very, very good tool. I think it's something that we worked really hard on in the last maybe two, three years, and uh, I think it's really pointed in the right direction. So uh, keep up the good work, keep the eye on real important thing here, and it's the student growth, the student achievement. So I want to thank you and, and everybody. I know it's not just Ken, so you're just, you're just, just we're just shooting the messenger here. <laughs> um, and so um, with that, uh, yep. I'm sorry. I just wanted to mention, I know there was a high school dress code issue that happened over the last couple of weeks. And I just wanted to commend the district response, especially Matt Johnson, um, on that Frank Beckman podcast. Um, I encourage the community members just to go to Frank Beckman's website, search for Matt Johnson, and this like five minute, 36 second podcast will come up. And just did an outstanding job showing that we care about kids, we enforce a dress code for the right reasons, and not making any kind of stand on any one issue. And I just thought the way the district handled it um, should be commended. I was just going to say that, but perfect. I'm glad somebody else had the same thought I did because sometimes I think maybe I'm in a, in a vacuum with my own personal thoughts. And, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think a little more time than not. But uh, I just want to say that uh, it, it is very, very um, difficult in today's day and age to do what you all do. I just want to commend you all for, and I know it could happen in any building, so um, I want to commend you all for the work that you all do, and it was handled um, perfect from top to bottom. So, Matt, thank you. Um, please, Tim, if you would let uh, Steve and the staff at the high school know. Um, so, with that, it's yours. Just a couple of things. Paul, thank you very much for hosting us out here at Leonard. Appreciate your hospitality and presentations tonight. Uh, I think the only other thing I'd say, since um, uh, we already talked about the, the dress code issue, is that um, I, I want the board to know that I uh, consistently remind our administrators that there's nothing more important that they do on a daily basis than get evaluation. If you don't get the evaluation component right, a lot of things start to blow up and get messy and, and kids don't learn. And so um, while we're not uh, maybe perfect with everything that we do, I think we are getting better and better in our evaluation tool and how we utilize it. And that's something that, um, that we all can be very proud of. So, uh, All right. I have a motion for a closed session. A motion, please. Dr. Brazen. Move to meet in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act, Section 8A, to consider a periodic personnel evaluation of an employee if the named person requests a closed hearing. Support. Support Ms. Schaefer. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries.